This video covers evaluative criteria. This is one of the things students tend to struggle with the most. So after watching this video and reading pages 27 to 46 in the Bardock book, please don't hesitate to reach out to me for help. Also, I wanna get it out of the way now. Criteria is plural, criterion is singular. As policy analysts, you'll be recommending one course of action from among several. How do you make that decision? How do you decide which is best? The systematic process of policy analysis requires that we show our work. We have to decide how we came to our recommendations and describe that. Evaluative criteria are the characteristics or elements upon which our analysis is based. Most often, these are the constraints we have to work within. For example, a certain amount of money might already be allocated to whatever solution you come up with, so your policy needs to stay within a budget. Or maybe there is a limited number of staff available to implement your solution, so whatever you come up with has to take this into account. For this step of the process, you'll be deciding which criteria you'll be using and defining what they mean in terms of your problem. You can think of this step as identifying and operationalizing variables in basic research. You have to spell out exactly what each criterion means. That is, what will you be looking for with each? There are many criteria for you to choose from. These are the most basic and most commonly used. To help people remember these criteria, I jokingly refer to them as the four E's even though one of them starts with an F. I'll give you a second to roll your eyes. The first one is effectiveness. Your textbook refers to this as hitting the target. Effectiveness refers to whether and how much the alternative will impact the problem. How well will that alternative help achieve the desired end state that we've identified? Examples of effectiveness in policy analysis could include whether and how much a policy reduces the total number of people sleeping on the street in a given night, or increases the use of public transit, or slows down transmission of a virus. Perhaps the most commonly used criterion is efficiency. Efficiency focuses on the balance of inputs and outputs. Most often, efficiency has to do with money. Policymakers will want to know that they're not authorizing an outrageously expensive policy. And dollars are the easiest and most universally understood metric to quantify efficiency. There's more to it than just cost, but that is a good place to start. You'll almost always have to consider the costs of your policy alternatives. We tend to underestimate costs, typically because policy implementation requires more than a person might assume. It helps to look at the implementation costs of similar policies or policies you borrowed from other places, keeping geographic cost of living differences in mind. Efficiency also accounts for the value of returns to your policy. This is difficult to come up with usually. What is the value of keeping a single person off the street for a given night? What is the value of increasing ridership on public transit? What is the value of one fewer person contracting a virus? To estimate returns, it helps to imagine what the problem itself costs. Local hospitals might have millions of dollars in unpaid care because homeless individuals end up in the emergency room. They end up there with ailments related to sleeping outside, but will never be able to pay those bills. However you do account for efficiency, make sure your inputs and outputs use the same unit. Rather than reporting that a problem costs $1 million and we can solve it for $1,000 per person, make sure you're comparing apples with apples. The problem costs us a total of $1 million and the solution is projected to cost a total of $800,000. Or the problem costs $1,400 per person impacted and we can solve it for $1,000 per person. The next commonly used criterion is equity. This is difficult to define and quantify, but represents a real and important concern. This is an appeal to justice and fairness. As the Bardock book tells us, there are many potential definitions of equity and fairness, so you'll need to specifically define what it means in the case of your analysis. Perhaps the problem you've identified disproportionately harmed women or people of color. In this case, we might want to reduce that harm to bring about equity. In situations where inequity is the problem you've identified, you'll want to decide whether to include equity as its own criterion or define effectiveness in terms of reducing disparity. This will depend on the case and the way you define your terms, but the key is to be thorough and clear about your decisions. Last of the four E's is feasibility. This is a basic term, and you will need to decide which type of feasibility you're going to be using. Basically, this refers to whether the policy you're assessing can be implemented. Is there something that makes this policy difficult or impossible? The types of feasibility that you can choose from when you use feasibility include political feasibility, administrative feasibility, and technical feasibility. Political feasibility refers to whether the policy you are suggesting would be viewed favorably or survive the political process. Would policymakers in your government go for it? 
You would need to know the general attitude and values of your particular government, state, local, or federal, to be able to estimate the political feasibility of a potential solution. Or we could consider administrative feasibility, which refers to whether the bureaucratic infrastructure exists to implement a policy solution. Are there enough employees within the unit or organization to pull the policy off? Does it require a department that doesn't currently exist? Finally, you could consider technical feasibility. For natural, technological, physical reasons, is the policy you're considering even possible? You wouldn't suggest shooting all of our garbage into outer space or policies that require technology that doesn't exist, like flying cars or electricity through the air. An example of this in recent years revolves around police body cameras. In their early stages, body cameras were very expensive because the technology was new and they had limited storage capacity and collecting, storing, and sorting the use of body camera footage required more technical pack capacity than most local governments had. Over time, as technology has improved, body cameras have become cheaper, can store more footage, and the uploading, sorting, and tagging of files can be automated more than before. Technical feasibility is becoming less of a mark against body cameras for police departments. Other criteria that aren't feasibility include things like liberty and freedom. Does a policy alternative impinge on a person's rights? For example, there are very few cases where government can mandate a person buy a product or limit a person's movements. The last one we'll discuss is social acceptability. This is often regionally and culturally defined. Policies that are acceptable in some places may be offensive in others. Consider regional differences on cultural and social issues. Consider the places that considered or implemented bathroom limitations. Those of us belonging to other cultures consider bathroom bans outrageous and ridiculous. There are more criteria in the Bardock book, so have a look there if you find these don't quite fit what you're looking for. Not all criteria are necessary or appropriate for every problem. Some make more sense than others. For example, technical feasibility probably doesn't need to be considering when evaluating pay scales and Liberty probably doesn't need to be considered when choosing between two makers of minivan for a state motor pool acquisition. Once you've decided on your criteria, you'll need to operationalize them. All of the definitions that I gave you so far are extremely broad. You'll need to define exactly what they mean in your circumstances. I offered a few examples when describing these criteria. Operationalizing your criteria well means eliminating the possibility that a reader could be confused by your definition. More specificity is better than less. A good way to make sure you're being specific enough is to try to identify a single indicator or measure that captures your criterion. Cost is a vague way of describing efficiency. Cost per consumer per year is a more specific measure. Improving standardized test scores is a vague way of describing effectiveness. Increasing the proportion of students scoring proficiency or above in math on the eighth grade Smarter Balance exam is... When choosing between criteria, it is helpful to look at the available literature. In certain policy areas or with certain problems, some criteria are widely agreed upon as important metrics that may already be established. In addition, since you'll be projecting potential outcomes based on existing data, it is a good idea to define your criteria so they fall in line with. As I've already mentioned, efficiency is almost always going to be a concern. It will likely be part of nearly every policy evaluation you undertake. Since public policy is paid for with public dollars, making sure we are accounting for the use of those dollars and spending them wisely is essential. This video offered brief guidance on evaluative criteria, but does not substitute for reading the text. There is a much richer explanation in the text than is offered here. What will help you the most in developing and defining your evaluative criteria in all reality is practice. I will be offering critical feedback on this week's worksheet, and you may find yourself revisiting some of the criteria you decide on. This is expected and a normal part of the learning process. Best of luck. I look forward to reviewing your work.